Good morning, everyone. Um, so I am very honored to introduce Matthew Sani, who is the Chief Data and Technology Officer for the Cook County um, State's Attorney's Office, which, as most of you probably know, is Chicago. So under uh, State's Attorney Kim Fox, um, Matthew has been working um, on data and how to use that data um, to make change within the office. But one of the big things is how to be transparent with that data within their community um, to build trust. So a lot of the same themes that we were seeing yesterday. Um, and so we're really excited to have Matthew here. He's been with the office since 2017, is actually the, the first to be in the role of Chief Data and Technology Officer. So Matthew, if you would come up, please. All right, well, thank you, Nikki, and uh, thank you, everyone, for having me here. I'm excited to talk to you about the work that we're doing at the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. All right, let's see how this works. Great. So this um, sits in my office, and this is actually um, um, was created the first day I took office, or took, um, joined the office and sat down with Kim Fox and asked her what she wanted to accomplish with data. And this is what she told me. She said, to be the most open and transparent prosecutor's office in the country. And so this is kind of our North Star in how we use data. Um, we use data internally to help determine, um, you know, what's happening in our office, how we can inform policy, and, and um, how we can make better decisions, how we can improve outcomes. But at the root of what we're, all, we're doing is really just to open up the doors and allow people to understand what our office does. And so how we got here um, is going to be a part of the story. What we've learned throughout this process um, we'll touch base upon. And then we're going to talk a little bit about educating elected officials, because I think this is something that um, ended up being uh, an important um, a quest in our uh, world of data transparency um, because we do have a, a lot of elected officials in Cook County and um, they are verbose and, and they do talk about our work a lot, both in the positive and, the, and, and unfortunately in the negative as well. Um, so getting started, this is actually um, where um, the work started. And so this is a pledge um, that a group called Shy Hack Night, uh, which is a collective of technologists that meet once a week in Chicago, um, they essentially think about um, public sector um, technology, how to improve um, the way government works, how to create uh, uh, public-private partnerships with regards to technology, how to encourage open data as a whole. Um, they put together this pledge, um, partially in response to um, Laquan McDonald and um, the video of him being shot um, by a police officer, um, uh, to say, you know, our office needed to be more transparent. And they reached out to every single candidate and invited them to come talk um, to their forum about why they're running for office and how um, they um, think about data and how they would support transparency. And they asked every single one of those candidates to also sign this pledge. You'll notice that you see Kim Fox nicely um, uh, written on there. She did um, sign this pledge and agree to it. Um, you'll notice that we, there was another candidate, Donna Moore, who's a currently a commissioner. Um, there are two blank spots, and one of them, I don't even know who that person is, quite frankly, um, but the other one is Anita Alvarez, and she actually was the current um, state's attorney in um, Cook County at the time um, of this pledge being circulated, and she was running for re-election, and she unfortunately refused to, to sign the pledge and even engage with this group, I believe, as a whole. Um, I don't believe that's the reason why she necessarily lost um, uh, the election, but it was a missed opportunity for her campaign and for her candidacy, for sure. So... When Kim came into office, um, she already had this commitment um, to make um, the office as transparent as possible um, using data. And so, um, uh, you know, what was great about this was this was like a public social pressure um, a goal that she had set, right, that actually started externally. Um, um, and, you know, the motivation wasn't just to, you know, campaign on a prom or promise something in a campaign and then meet it, but it was actually, you know, thinking back to the history that Chicago and Cook County has um, with the criminal justice system and the public, there's a lot of distrust, right? And, you know, I can go through the history of, of um, um, the shortcomings or failings of criminal justice system in um, Cook County and Chicago, um, but it's fairly well known. Um, there have been some uh, pretty atrocious things, and I think the the um, the best way to kind of articulate this is actually Cook County has been um, 2012 was considered the false capital um, confession or false confession capital of the world, um, and that's just because of so many cases coming through with corrupt detectives, corrupt police officers, coercing confessions out of individuals, getting them to confess to crimes that that were not theirs, and. 
Well, I will not talk about that. Our office does a lot of work trying to clean that up, and, and we've um, uh, been able to overturn a lot of convictions that our office at one point won. Um, so, um, and the other piece of this, and this is kind of really apropos now, um, um, is we knew that Kim Fox was not going to be the state's attorney forever. Right, that at some point she would leave office. And I don't know if you've heard, but she's announced that she's not running for re-election, so her term will end at December of 2024. Um, but if we created data transparency um, during her um, administration, we believe that it will have to carry on in future administrations, regardless of the political alignings of the individuals that um, um, come into the office. So essentially thinking about this, you know, once the genie gets out of, um, you know, or once the tube is out of the toothpaste, it's really hard to put it back. Or once the toothpaste is out of the tube, it's really hard to put it back. Um, and then upon her becoming elected, she actually reiterated this commitment. And so I, she was elected in December of 2016. Um, she took office shortly thereafter. I joined the office about a year later. Um, but um, even prior to me coming in, that commitment was stated and reinstated. And even um, about a month before I joined the office, they released their first data report looking at what the office did in 2016. So how we were able to do this, right? Because this is a big daunting task and it's very scary. Um, the first thing we did was we established an owner, which that's why they created the role of chief data officer. That was someone that was going to be responsible for this. If this was successful, ultimately that was the chief data officer's you know, success. And if it was a failure, it you know, fell at one person. It was th their responsibility. Um, and, um, you know, this was a slow process, right? As um, Nikki mentioned, I was the first person to come into this role. And actually, when I first came into the role, my purview was not even um, involving technology. The second thing she said to me um, on day one was, um, I don't want you to fix printers. Um, and so um, for um, those first two years, I really just thought about data and how we can use data better in the office. Um, and then um, ultimately, we set a goal, right? And that was really... Um, um, uh, set a goal with a timeline, right? And that was really um, a powerful motivator to kind of figure this out. So I joined in November of, of 2017, and we, she had said that by February of 2018, we wanted to release this data. Now, I came in, I'm not a lawyer. Um, my interactions with the criminal justice system have been generally limited, um, thank God. Um, so I, you know, didn't necessarily, I understood the difference between jail and prison, but I didn't necessarily understand the difference between grand jury and preliminary hearing, um, which are two functions that exist in Cook County. Um, so what um, this meant was I had to sit down and start learning a lot of the terms, a lot of the um, ideas um, that were being displayed in our data um, very quickly, and then start making fast um, decisions on this, right? Knowing that um, this was a big, daunting task, what we did was we established some principles to guide us in how we would do this, right? So the first um, principle actually came from um, State's Attorney Fox, and it was we do not want to editorialize, right? The ability to sit there and point fingers at her predecessor and say, look at what she did wrong or, or whatnot, or look at what we're doing right, was going to be there, but that's not the purpose of this, right? The purpose was transparency. So the idea was to release information without actually editorializing and let the public and the community be able to um, um, review it and, um, and um, assess it. Um, we also did not want to do any harm, right? The information we were releasing was about individuals, right? And we often think about victims and witnesses um, um, in the, in, that, that get impacted by the criminal justice system, by crime in general, and we wanted to make sure we protected those. But we also wanted to be sensitive to the individuals that were being accused of crimes, right? Some of them were found innocent at the end of the day. Some of them ultimately served a term, had their cases expunged, you know, um, and moved on with their life. And so we really wanted to be sensitive to the individuals that were being reflected in the information. Um, we also wanted to provide as much detail as possible, which those two things, you know, trying to protect individuals and giving a bunch of information kind of run against each other, right? And so we had to be very thoughtful and sensitive about that. Um, and, the, um, um, and it was incredibly important that the data that we were reflecting actually showed the decision points of what the office did, right? At the end of the day, what we were doing was we were, we were publishing data about our office. We weren't publishing data about the criminal justice system as a whole, right? We weren't publishing data about CPD and what they did and didn't do right. We were publishing data about our office. So the decision points that we focused on were um, how we reviewed cases and when we uh, decided to approve charges, um, felony charges, um, and then ultimately how we prosecuted those cases and what the outcome of those prosecutions were with regards to dispositions and then sentencing. Um, and then we also knew that this wasn't going to be a one and done, right? That ultimately we were climbing a, climbing a hill, climbing a mountain, and so this was going to have to be an iterative process, right? So um, we 
we're not going to um, hamper ourselves by letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, so our initial release, we released um, hundreds of thousands of cases um, and defendants and charges, um, and sentences for that matter. Um, the information got down to the charge level. So if someone was, uh, had 16 counts of ag battery on them, we released a row um, for each one of those counts, showing exactly what we filed, and then ultimately what happened um, uh, to that case. Um, we had four tables that we originally um, released. Um, the four tables were um, an intake table. So this was cases being brought to us, right? Individuals being brought to us. And then in the review process, what was our review outcome um, at that time? Um, an initiation table. Upon um, the decision to charge someone, what did we um, end up charging them with and how many charges did we charge them with? Um, what statutes did we believe they violated? A disposition table. So for each charge that we filed and we recorded a disposition, what was that disposition? Did they plead guilty? Was there a verdict of guilty? Was there a finding of guilty? Was there a finding of not guilty? Did we nolly the case? Um, uh, and things of that nature. And then ultimately sentencing. Um, and we actually have a big resentencing program in Illinois. So we didn't just release the current sentence or the original sentence, but we wanted to release every sentence that that person was filed on. As a lot of individuals ultimately were resentenced over time, and so we wanted to show how sentences were changing, how initial sentences might have been longer, and then future sentences um, became uh, smaller. Um, so we did this, and um, we were excited. Um, it was really interesting um, because we didn't know what the reaction was going to be. Um, there were a couple things that um, happened um, initially. Um, one, um, the, um, we did, made the decision to release um, the, the presiding judge on every case um, and then the presiding judge over the sentence on every case. Um, and so um, in Cook County, judges are elected. And so ultimately, the metric that you would evaluate an elected judge in criminal courts would be how they preside over cases. Um, so we felt that was a fair reflection of, um, of their job or their work um, at the end of the day. And also, it impacted how we handled cases. You know, we knew there were certain judges that were more prone to do certain things. And so ultimately, you could see that, those patterns in, um, in the data. Um, we got a lot of resistance from our office of the chief judge. Um, essentially, they were not excited that we were providing this information, but they also did not fight us on it. Um, so they, you know, didn't want it, um, but they, um, I have a letter that sits in my office that, um, uh, you know, they sent around internally saying that if they were to fight it, they would be um, against transparency and they can't be against transparency. Um, beyond that, um, it was actually a little bit of crickets. Um, and so what was um, interesting was we didn't um, you know, press, ask questions, and looked at the information, but they didn't do much with the information. Um, we went back to Shy Hack Night and shared the information with them, and you know, it was a great presentation, and they were very grateful, and you know, they, they, they felt good that they had this initiative, and they got to see it through, and you know, a lot of high fives in that, if you will. Um, but you know, it, there wasn't much happening there. Um, and we really spent some time trying to think about, like, why did this not necessarily fail, right? Because we did what we set out to do, but why didn't have the, the, the reverberation that we were expecting to happen, right? This was pretty groundbreaking. No one had ever released data at this level um, for a prosecutor's office. We're the second largest prosecutor's office in the country, right? Like, people should care about this, right? And there should be more fanfare or more noise. And what we realized was there are a couple things um, um, happening here. There was limited um, criminal justice literacy, right? The same issue that I had coming into it, not necessarily understanding the difference between a preliminary hearing and grand jury, the general public doesn't understand, right? Nolly prosecution, a term I never heard before I joined the office, right, um, was a very common outcome of cases. No one understands what that means, right? And so ultimately, there was a huge education that was necessary um, to do on the... Um, on, the, um, on, on this, the legal process, um, what we call criminal justice literacy. Then um, the um, other aspect of it was, you know, we released such granular data, right? We had tables with millions of rows in them. Very exciting for your data scientists in the world. Not that many data scientists in the world. So ultimately, this became only exciting for this small intersection of data scientists that understand the criminal justice system, which back in 2018, not that many of them. In fact, very few of them. Um, yeah, the, the, the one probably sitting back in, in the back. Um, and so um, 
you know, we kind of tried to think about how we could improve the, both the literacy of the data and then the literacy of the criminal justice system. And then the other piece of this was the number one question we got asked about was, we want criminal history. We want to know criminal history. We want to understand that. And especially for doing analysis around the criminal justice system, understanding how um, different people might be treated, one of the major um, factors is the criminal history of the individual, right? A person that's been more um, criminal justice involved tends to have um, harsher consequences when they become criminal justice involved in the future. Um, but we actually intentionally did not release anything that could allow you to identify criminal history on an individual. And the reason that was, um, was because the, um, um, the fidelity, the detailed nature of every case that we put in there was so high that I could look up someone, right, um, in that system and use the court dates that were provided, right, to, I, and match it to the newspaper to understand, like, okay, this homicide case that Matthew Sani was in, involved in that I'm reading about in the paper is this row of data in, in there. But we didn't want to then turn around and open up that entire person's history. We did not want to make a way to look up people's rap sheets. That was not the goal. We were not doing background checks um, for individuals. And so we understood that this was a limitation in what we were publishing. We were very well aware of it. We heard the calls um, for criminal history, and we started to think about how we could better um, deal with this. So what we did, we created trainings. Um, and trainings were very powerful ways to kind of inform people about how to work with the data, um, how to understand the criminal justice system. Uh, we created a process for researchers, who we love researchers, right, um, to actually access more sensitive data, um, including criminal history. In fact, uh, individually identifiable. If they had a reason, a legitimate reason to know uh, accused individual's uh, first and last name, we would give that to them. If they needed to know a social security number because they were trying to do some matching with another data set, you know, we would give it to them. We put controls around it. We made sure that, you know, they couldn't use it for malicious uh, purposes, that the information would be protected at all times, but we had no problem providing access to that information. We actually improved our data release, right? We added um, not just more data as we got more data, but we did some uh, column standardization. We uh, created a new table. Um, we added some additional columns to it. Um, we created a lot of materials um, to ultimately help people you know, self-teach a little bit on how to work with this data and think about this data. And then we created public dashboards, right? Which public dashboards are kind of the easy way to create easy digest easily digestible um, data for individuals to, to read and consume where they don't have to manipulate rows and rows of data um, moving forward. And finally, we just maintained and kept a dialogue with the general public um, as much as we possibly could. You know, whether it was people emailing us, we have an email account, saodata at um, cookcountyil.gov, and we get tons of emails asking about things from reporters to researchers to you know, um, random individuals just curious about what we're doing. Um, to going out and presenting in um, Cook County um, through our community engagement team, um, talking to our elected officials, really trying to understand what individuals wanted or needed to better be informed about the um, system. So hacking for justice. Um, this was one of our um, uh, approaches to training. And this was actually a program that um, started in 2018 where we did a two-day hackathon um, the, um, the first time. Um, had about 30 people um, from the public. It was free for them, right? We had a little bit of a um, screening or evaluation process to identify candidates that would be good for this, that was the right fit. Um, but um, there was no cost to it for them. We brought in um, um, trainers. Um, some came from the office, but a lot came from just um, the general public, some researchers and such that we had worked with. And we took people who may not have known anything about um, the criminal justice system or very limited about the criminal justice system or, um, or other individuals who may not have known anything about how to work with data and basically got them from zero to 60 in about 20 hours of, of work over two days. Um, we used R, which is an open source tool that allows you to manipulate large amounts of data. We had the data available for them and then we were able to give them instruction and had them work in cohorts. The beauty of this was in this first room, we had sworn police officers we had individuals that had family that was cur currently incarcerated. We had researchers and we had reporters, right? Kind of the, the, the full spectrum of individuals that are thinking about the criminal justice system, sitting in the same room, using the same data set, reviewing it, asking, it, asking questions together, and coming to answers and conclusions um, um, hand in hand. It was really a cool experience, and we saw something happening there that we were able to kind of move forward and, and continue um, th uh, throughout our work. Um, 
we created a data use um, agreement. And so this was a tool that allowed us to provide um, great access to any data that we had to any researcher um, that was interested um, in working that ultimately had some controls around it again. Um, and um, you know, with those controls comes liability, but nonetheless um, um, allowed them to access information that was much more sensitive to do much more interesting, um, profound research than the open data allowed them uh, to do. Um, we've been able to execute um, DUAs with Yale, University of Chicago, Loyola University, others. So it's something that we're, we're proud of. We're, you know, it's available. We, we want to continue working. It takes a little bit of time, um, but it, it is a, um, a powerful mechanism to provide greater access and greater transparency um, under certain circumstances. Um, we improve the data. So um, ultimately, um, we uh, realized that the system that we're pulling from, our own case management system, records data in many different ways, um, sometimes the same data in many different ways, which can be very confusing to analyze. So we did some uh, analysis of the different data points in there and consolidated. One of the big things we had trouble with was findings of no probable cause. So we ultimately created a, sing a single flag that kind of identified if this was a finding no probable cause coming out of a preliminary hearing, um, it was available to you to understand. We created a fifth um, table. Um, you could analyze what was happening with diversion in the four tables that we provided but it didn't really show you how folks were coming in and out of diversion programs as a whole, um, and didn't show you individuals who came into diversion programs and might have uh, failed out, right? Not, not, have not completed. So we realized that this was something that people were hungry for. We could provide access to it. It wasn't gonna be problematic, if you will. And so ultimately we created a fifth table there. Um, and then we again just standardized some language um, in, the, um, um, in the data sets. We realized that you know, we tried not to manipulate our data too much when we first released it to try to leave it as raw as we possibly could. But as we realized there was confusion and we kept answering the same questions over and over again, it was like, okay, let's just smooth out some of these edges and, and improve the data. We created three dashboards um, as well. Um, we created a general dashboard that um, lets you see in um, each year going back to 2011, what our office has done with felony cases, um, how many cases we've received, how many cases we've approved, what the breakdown of uh, those approvals are amongst top categories, um, how those cases um, have um, ultimately um, uh, been prosecuted, and then what was happening with the sentence outcome. Um, it's good, it's limited. All dashboards are gonna be limited at, um, at, uh, at some point because you've gotta make some design decisions, right, before you organize and roll up the data. And so it is a good tool for reporters just to go and get, you know, top level numbers, um, you know, for um, individual, you know, when we hire, we actually, um, our, well, our hiring test for data, for the data team it sends folks to the dashboard and has them do some analysis off there. Um, so, you know, there is value um, in it, but me as a data scientist, um, I find it personally very unsatisfying. I want to get my hands into the, the actual raw data and, and start manipulating it. But it's a very easy tool there. And then um, while we have lots of constituencies that are um, very interested in our work, there are kind of two major ones that show up that are essentially um, victim advocate groups that um, we wanted to be um, um, particularly um, sensitive to, um, domestic violence and sexual assault. And so we built separate dashboards just to show how um, um, our office was handling cases um, in these uh, couple of categories. And so um, those are the dashboards that we um, came out with um, initially. So this is the general dashboard, as I mentioned. Um, again, it's you know nice, it's helpful. We allow, you know, um, we have a lot of political geographies, and I'll kind of talk about that later. Um, because we're a county office, the commissioners are the ones who determine our budget. So what we did was we designed on this dashboard the ability for them to look at their district and see what we're doing. Um, you know, we don't do anything at the municipal level. We don't do anything at the um, you know, uh, Chicago City Council level um, or, st you know, State House, State Senate. It's not that we couldn't. It's just the fact that, um, you know, again, design choices and, and ultimately we wanted to try to make things as easy and clean and, and simple to, to review. Um, this is our domestic violence dashboard. It actually looks at things longitudinally um, in our office, how we've been receiving and prosecuting domestic violence cases. There um, the ability to kind of, sw you know, Domestic violence in Cook County is primarily a misdemeanor offense based upon the statutes. So we do handle felony um, domestic violence cases, but you'll notice that in a single year, we're looking at about five, 600 cases, while at the misdemeanor level, we're looking at thousands of, of, of domestic violence cases coming through. So I should also mention that 
the data that we have the highest fidelity on, especially when we started this project, which is changing a little bit as we move forward in time, is our felony case data. That's really the, the um, bulk of it. The other aspect of this is our office, as it's resourced, the vast majority of our prosecutorial resources go on felony cases, right? We do get a lot of misdemeanor cases, but ultimately that's a very small team and it's a small amount of the work that, that our office handles and traditionally has always been handling. And then this is our um, sexual assault dashboard. Um, we played around with, and um, sex crimes kind of have a broader sense of, um, of different types of charges. Um, and, and the category, generally speaking, is, is pretty broad. Um, so we designed it to have a little bit more options to kind of drill into how a case might start at um, a criminal predatory sexual assault and end um, up in a different category of, of case when it was ultimately pled out or prosecuted um, by the office. So we also created um, additional materials. And what was interesting about this was when we went into this process of creating additional materials to help um, people understand our open data we really thought that this was going to be for the data scientists in the world, right, to be able to better understand what our office was doing. What we learned was this was actually a really great tool for anyone that wanted to talk about what our office was doing. So we built out a data, uh, a data glossary, a data dictionary. Generally speaking, that's for the data, the data scientists, the researchers and all that. But we built out a flow chart, and this flow chart, like, we, we now distribute it internally for when new ASAs join our office because it, for the first time you can visualize what can happen um, with a case at the felony level. Um, and then we also created like a little tutorial page um, on how to read the data um, that kind of walks individuals through how to take data and match it um, and, and analyze it and, and all of that. Um, so this is what our glossary looks like. Um, you can see the five um, tables. Um, it's a PDF, it's on our website, um, you can click through it, and then within each category of column, it, it has a deeper explanation of what um, the values might be, how to think about some of the more, more common values, things of that nature. This is the flowchart, and this really is um, um, kind of the, the crux. And if you look at this, right, one, it's very nicely designed. Uh, we had a designer come in and, 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 and kind of smooth out the edges on this one. Um, but it really is kind of uh, dizzying if you look at it, right? Um, and if you actually pay attention to it, you can see that there are arrows that like, can potentially move you in a circle forever and ever and ever um, <laughs> based upon you know, the choices that could be made as a case moves to the criminal justice system. Um, and you know, um, it's a very helpful tool to kind of articulate um, what, um, uh, what can happen. We also color-coded it, um, you'll notice, to uh, show that the, um, um, the different tables that we provide, um, um, which sections of the, um, of the flow chart they impact. So orange is our intake table, yellow is our initiations table, green is our dispositions table, blue is our, uh, light blue is our sentencing table, and then ultimately um, the darker blue is our diversions table. So, um, uh, it correlates nicely with the data that we've released as well. And then this is our how to read a data section. Um, and on our website, it's a longer form page that kind of goes through and, and shows, you know, this ID can match the this ID across these tables and um, really just how to kind of think about it. Has some warnings um, about like, if you do this, you might see this type of behavior. Um, you know, we included a lot of dates in our data, which is very helpful for doing analysis and time analysis. Um, but sometimes the dates don't make logical sense where we will, you know, um, a case will be charged um, before um, we receive that case, which how is that possible? Um, and we explain kind of what is happening in the data flow that would create dates like that. Um, it's not like years apart, I'm talking days, but still it's something that we ended up people running into and, and asking questions about and so we wanted to make sure that we provided as much clarity and transparency around it as possible. So. That's kind of what we did with open data, and we thought, you know, we'd kind of, you know, made it, right? Um, but what we found ourselves dealing with was a lot of conversation about our office failing to do things, right? It's the number one thing that, um, you know, we had to, had to deal with. And I had a dashboard, and I could be like, look, this dashboard shows that we're actually prosecuting cases. Nobody cared, right? I had open data. It's like, you can do the analysis yourself, right? And nobody cared. And what ended up happening was this conversation um, in um, Cook County 
um, came from a few different places, but it was primarily driven by elected officials con um, responding to concerns by their um, constituents, which you know makes a lot of sense. Um, at, at the end of the day, um, Cook County has um, more elected officials per capita than um, any other um, county, I think, in the country. Um, we have, you know, just in Chicago, 50 city council people, right? That's a lot. Um, I, don't, I don't think Philly's anywhere close to that, if I recall. Um, we've got, you know, 17 commissioners, 32 state senators, 58 state representatives. We've got uh, nine or 10 um, congressional districts that touch Cook County. You know, the number of elected officials with constituents in Cook County was a lot. And you know the press often um, likes to write about um, you know horrible criminal activity in Cook County in Chicago. And when they write about it, then we get a call from a commissioner saying, "Hey, what's going on here? Why aren't you guys doing anything? You guys don't do anything, right?" And from there, we had to figure out how we could better help under like help create an understanding for um, for these elected officials, really. To help us create to create the space for us to just be able to do our jobs, right? So we didn't have to respond to so much stuff, right? Um, and so ultimately, um, you know, things like the dashboards they weren't looking at, right? Even the one that I we built out for the commissioners, like they didn't look at. I actually talked to um, a senior anchor for one of our um, major news networks in Chicago, and we had the dashboard out for I think three years, and he was like why didn't you guys tell us about this? And we were like, we did. We sent you a press release three years ago. Why didn't you look at it? You know? Um, so like, it was really just something that like, we trying to like cut through the noise, if you will. So the solution we came up with was we were gonna generate monthly memos that automatically um, get emailed out to every single elected official that shows them what we did in their jurisdiction for the previous month, um, as well as the greater community. Um, so ultimately, um, these are what the memos ended up looking like. So we, this is an example of a memo for Chicago. This is an example of a, a memo for um, a commissioner district. This is an example of a memo for um, a ward. And if we zoom in, we, it's three pages. It's very simple. And we're just showing um, a highlight, uh, top line numbers of how many cases we received, how often we approved them, what was our rates, then doing it again for Chicago in this case. We then do a breakdown about the most common cases that we're getting, um, so people can see. So when they say, uh, you're not prosecuting gun cases, I can say, well, in your ward, in August of 2022, we charged 95% of them. And you know, we ultimately got convictions on 80% of these gun cases. So you know, maybe that's not prosecuting cases, uh, gun cases, but like, these are what the numbers are. We then include um, racial breakdowns as well, um, because the racial questions are um, uh, constant and critical. Um, are you being equitable? Are you being fair? Um, then we move into diversion, um, because we want to actually highlight diversion and show that there are other ways to resolve cases. And so we show our diversion, um, graduated failures, um, and the different types of cases that are moving through diversion. Um, and then finally, we move into incidences and arrests, where we have that information. One of the big things that we have to constantly remind individuals is if there's no arrest, our office never sees that case, right? And so we actually started showing the number of incidences that took place, right? Which you can see in um, this month, it was 906 criminal incidents that took place with only 90 arrests um, taking place, which means 10% of the crime ended up with an arrest. And then we break it down by the top categories um, at the end of the day, um, and then we show a breakdown of violence. And I think this is really the part that like kind of set people in a way that like, oh man, that's really um, uh, shocking or surprising um, and we didn't really expect this. Um, and so um, most violent crime, unfortunately, goes without an arrest, which I think, you know, me as a researcher, I wanna say, okay, like let's fix the criminal justice system, but let's also think about how we can address um, violent crime because arresting people doesn't actually address a lot of violent crime. And that's, that's a real um, issue that kind of, that exists and that we've been help, um, being able to kind of show with this. So 
Um, this is kind of a quick overview of the process, but it was a multi-year process that took a while for us to refine and kind of come up with a template. And we worked with a lot of elected officials to kind of get a sense for them. We're fortunate in Cook County, they manage um, a list of all elected officials. So we had a list of everyone to email. And then ultimately, um, we built out a, um, a, a tool that um, you, know, you can push a button and does all the work. And then we do a QC process to make sure it's right. And then we hit send. Um, really quickly, what's next? We're going to continue to engage with our community, all right? We want feedback. We want to better understand. The tool that um, we've created a tool using those memos that allows us to share those memos with the general public. So we're looking to release that sometime within the next year. We're bringing back Hacking for Justice. We kind of put it on hold during COVID, um, but we've got three um, uh, weekend uh, hackathons planned coming up. Um, we're looking to release internal analysis done with our open data. Um, and we want to cement a culture of, of open data just for the future state's attorney um, so that as um, whoever comes in, um, they carry the torch of, of transparency with data as well. So thank you. So we got a, a little bit of time for questions. Um, for, those of you who, uh, for those of you who were here, for those of you who were here yesterday, you'll know the, the procedure. For those of you who weren't here, like where were you? Um, but, uh, but we have cards uh, on the tables, and uh, my colleague Paul, I think, is going to be walking through and grabbing them. You can write uh, questions down, and, and throughout the day, we'll do our best to answer them. You actually answered one of them right away, which is, you know, with, with uh, State Attorney Fox not running for re-election, what you think the future of this initiative is likely to be. Yeah, I mean, my, my hope is in, um, that it continues, right? Um, my goal in the next 18 months, as we're preparing for this, is to um, help uh, um, enhance this culture. Um, I'll actually show you. I'll do one. I have one extra slide. Um, this is, um, a, we have six courthouses um, in Cook County that handle felony cases. And this is looking at the, the rate of pleading to a misdemeanor, starting with a felony case and pleading to a misdemeanor. And it's looking at it over time across these six courthouses. And you'll notice that one courthouse kind of moves away from the pack, right? This analysis has been able to be done with our open data from the day that we released it, and no one's done it, right? I don't know why Maywood, that courthouse, District 4, is higher than um, other courthouses. They're doing something different, right? Now, that's the type of open transparency that, like, I would hope that reporters in Chicago would be asking about, why is Maywood different? Why are they handling cases different? Are they doing it better? Are they doing it worse, right? I don't know the answers to that. This came out of internal analysis that we did, but this is the type of thing that we want to expose and kind of show the power of open data to kind of help not necessarily keep the office in check, but just really like make a public-private relationship between um, the office and the community. Yeah, so I think that's, it's a great example of a couple of really important points. And I really want to applaud um, the effort that you and the, <clears throat> and the state's attorney have put together on that. Um, but, but one of the things you just said is, okay, the fact that one is higher or lower than the other, we don't know. That's a data point, right. not a trend, not a, not a value judgment, right? Yeah. And, and so we've seen this in the prosecutorial misconduct realm where that data is really hard to get to. And then when we say, well, there have been this many cases of alleged misconduct, this many found, people say, well, you're saying it's rampant. And we're like, well, I have no idea if it's rampant. What I know is this is the, the data. And I think that focus is really important to keep. Um, to that end, let me ask you, a lot of the data that you're talking about, it seems to be directed for external constituencies. And I'm wondering if you also have an initiative for administrative data within the office that might help with quality metrics within the office. Yeah, so um, there are... The short answer is yes. Um, we're in the process of implementing a new case management system. Um, and within that, um, as we're just, it's a multi-year process, um, as everything in government is. Um, you know, thinking about the data points you want to capture and ultimately um, refining and improving that. Um, coming out of some recent analysis, we're putting together working groups to improve um, um, our capture of why we're nollying cases when we choose to nolly cases. Um, Fourth Amendment violations are a reason to nolly a case. Um, we don't capture it as much as I would like to, right? Um, we have a lot of times we nolly a case and we don't know why that is. And so, you know, working with our ASAs, you know, I always try to balance putting things on their plate with, um, you know, answering questions, but working with our ASAs to try to figure out what are the right um, types of um, data points to capture around when we nolly a case and things of that nature. So there's a lot of internal as well. Um, and then we've got dashboards and such that we use more, 
whether it's for administrative and how we want to staff, or whether it's looking at just like trends over time and how things are moving. Great. So uh, we're almost at time. We've got two questions that uh, I think we'll have time for. One of them is, is pretty brief. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, two questions that involve incident data. So how or who is the collecting and, and giving the incident data to you? How are you getting that? And then um, how do you think about, you know, since most uh, incidents and arrests involve misdemeanors, um, it seems like there's a, it's a pretty big gap that the data doesn't have that incident data. So how do you talk about that when you're reporting out to like a ward leader? Sure. So um, the incident data and the arrest data is um, compiled by the uh, Chicago Police Department. And so it is incidences that have been reported to them um, that we have access to to analyze and look at and, and use for our own cases. The arrests are not just limited um, to um, felony arrests. So they're all arrests, right? So it's not that there was 10% of, um, um, uh, of incidences ended up in a felony arrest. It was 10% of uh, reported incidences ended up in any arrest, felony, misdemeanor, chargeable, non-chargeable, uh, however um, it was determined, um, you know, no one was um, apprehended um, related to 90% of the incidences. Okay, uh, and the last question uh, is um, languages. As you're communicating this to people, how many languages is the, are the reports available in? And, and uh, yeah. is that you know, something that, that the public... That, that's a great question. With? So right now, we're just English, right? Um, I think we're, as an office, trying to think better through how to... Um, um, connect with the different communities in Cook County. We are a very diverse community. Um, we have a large immigrant populations um, in Polish, obviously um, uh, Latinx. Um, um, there's a large Vietnamese population. Um, and so um, right now we're limited. We do have a um, strong community engagement team um, and they have ties into the com different communities and neighborhoods. And so um, while, um, you know, um, they're not necessarily translating our reports and such, they are going into these communities, talking about it, showing information, and, and, and communicating um, and, and learning and listening as well. So in, uh, in full disclosure, uh, State Attorney Fox is on the Quattron Center's advisory board, um, and we're, you know, we've always been big fans, but I, I thought that your um, guiding philosophy is maybe the most important one was prepare for an iterative process. Yeah. Um, you know, I think publishing data like this requires a lot of courage because you know you're going to get a lot of questions, a lot of opportunities to improve, uh, if you will. And I think the way you've embraced that um, is really impressive. And I, I just think making sure those iterations continue and you do things like more languages and figure out the instant data and your willingness to do that is really terrific. So thanks for sharing your experience with everybody and uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.